Welcome back ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for joining me here today. My name is Joshua Castillo. On this channel we focus on value investing, looking into different kinds of companies, seeing what kind of businesses we may want to own, as well as focusing on value investors, what they do, how they move, why they move, some of the letters they put out, and really the knowledge that they can give to us. So if that's something you're interested in, make sure to hit the like and subscribe down below. But today, if you couldn't already tell from the title, we're going to be talking about a company called CSV or Carriage Services Inc. One of the things about CSV and really this company in general is that they focus on funeral homes and cemeteries as well as they do a little bit of cremation work. But really it's funeral homes, things that we're going to talk about majorly today. And I honestly think that, you know, death has an opportunity and that's the title of this video, it's the title of the article as well. And I want to explain kind of what I'm seeing and why it fits my risk and my portfolio. And maybe if you see some Something, you'll let me know in the comments down below as well. Now to start off, not financial advice and I have sold a put on this company. So if you wonder like where my bias is and why I'm making a video about it, that's kind of like the background of why. Now Carriage Services Inc. is one of the largest providers in the world of funeral homes and cemeteries. They basically build out their business model by acquiring smaller or older funeral homes that are owned by someone that doesn't want to be in the business anymore and is looking to get rid of their business. Now they do 70% of their operation from funeral homes and then 30% of their revenue comes from cemeteries. Now they operate within 26 states. They have over 100 funeral homes, and they also have quite a few cemeteries as well in 11 states. Now we're gonna go over like kind of where those are and where they majorly fall, but the key thing is I want you to understand that, you know, if someone dies and they need funeral home or they wanna get cremated or whoever, this is one of those companies that kind of people will go to and one of the companies that um, holds a lot of these funeral homes and cemeteries across the United States. Now, if you're wondering how this company breaks itself down, you have funeral homes, cemeteries, those are the two different segments, and funeral homes is exactly what you think it would be. They're selling caskets, they're doing memorials, they have vehicles, they have everything you can basically think of that would go into a funeral home is what they offer. And cemeteries, these are portions of businesses that they buy when they have you know, acquisitions and things like that, you have a cemetery that they actually hold now. And now a big piece of this from both segments and why, um, you know, CSV is more successful than some of the private companies that operate within this space is the thing that is, is it has the use of leverage as well as the ability to operate at scale. Now, what I mean by leverage is because they're such a large company and they're continuing to grow, they can take out like a line of credit or take out debt to be able to buy more businesses and keep expanding their footprint throughout the United States. They don't operate internationally, but their competitor SCI operates internationally as well as in the United States. SCI is also the largest company within the United States for funeral homes and cemeteries. And then lastly, to keep going with this segment, one of the important things too is, is that when it comes to funeral homes, uh, you know, you're know, you acquiring not just the actual brand and the funeral home itself, you're acquiring the land that it's on. And that's very hard to replace, especially if there's already an established funeral home where a lot of people have buried their loved ones or they've used this a lot of times. It's very hard to replace. It's not hard to replace the management, but it's hard to replace the location. Now, looking at the financial results for the segments, one of the things that I wanted to go over was sort of how they break out their segments and what you should be focusing on if you're looking into this company. So I decided to take the uh, 10Q from Q3 2022, break out the segments, and this is gonna be for the nine months ended 2022 and nine months ended 2021. So first off, we're gonna be looking at the funeral home segment and then you can look here, the revenue has not moved that much. And as you would imagine, if you were anywhere in the United States at any point or just paying attention at all to everything that's happening around you, the last two years has been COVID. And what did COVID spike? It spiked the death rates in an unnatural way, meaning that um, you know you kind of like a normalized death rate as populations age. Obviously, COVID kind of ramped up a lot of that death rate, unfortunately, and a lot of people passed away as, you know, because of this virus or because of some other thing that kind of stemmed around this, whether it's not getting enough care or not having access to certain things, um, there was a lot of people that did pass away. But with that being said, going into 2022, things have started to normalize a lot more within trend. So looking down at the you know revenue sales, it's not surprising to see them go from 165 million down to 163 million for the nine months in 2021 and the nine months in 2022. Really the big thing is that you want to pay attention to is whether or not in the coming years um, this sort of trend will follow. 
And the, the nice thing is, is that the way management gives us the numbers is they have the acquired operating revenue as well as the same store operating revenue. So for the same store, it's down slightly, but they were able to acquire some operating revenue to actually be able to drive some down um, into the business rather than just relying on the original stores that they had. So you can see that the total revenue isn't that far down. It's maybe, let's call it, uh, you know, a million off, give or take, um, which isn't a huge deal for me at least. Now, the other thing is that their operating segments also have these significant metrics. So it's something I want to, you know, I want to mention it as well. So really the important thing is the contract volume and then also the burial rate and cremation rate. So for the same store sales or guess the contract volume is kind of what they use. You can see that it is down slightly. And again, we had an abnormal growth in 2021. So not that surprising. Um, the average revenue per contract, and this is going to be sort of, you know, if people have to make a contract either before they die or after they die, um, this is what you're going to be seeing here. Revenue hasn't changed that much. Um, and a lot of this revenue, average revenue per contract will be driven up by increased, um, you know, contract costs for the customer. Um, and as they are able to, you know, generally increase that, you'll see some of that drive down to the bottom line. The big thing too is the burial rate versus the cremation rate. I believe this is just within the business. Um, we'll kind of go over the burial rate and cremation rate later. It is something that I really wanted to talk on. And then of course you have the acquired contract volume along with the other metrics I had mentioned here. So again, the idea is they were going to keep acquiring businesses to be able to actually drive revenue and drive profit down to the bottom line and try to make as much money as possible, obviously, while still maintaining, you know, sort of that prestige that CSB has in space. Now, next up, cemetery segment. Um, the big thing here is, is again, they've been acquiring. Um, you can see that they've also divested some, which happens as well as they sell off businesses that don't perform as well. Um, but the same store operating revenues, not down too much. And then they've also acquired some operating revenues as well. So again, you know, the revenue story is that they're down slightly year over year, but not anything too crazy. And honestly, it's not that surprising to see them down year over year. Going down to the operating metrics. Now, again, you have the pre-need revenue as a percentage of operating revenue. And then you also have um, sort of the pre-need revenue in general in the thousands and then the at need. So again, the pre-need is kind of like someone does this beforehand, before they pass away or before a loved one pass away. They create these contracts. They create um, sort of a contract for revenue for the company. Um, it's recognized as pre-need and then at need is when say someone has already passed away and now you're going out of your way to go find someone. So that's why it's really important to see the difference and try to understand this business. Moving on, you can see that um, when it look when you're looking at cemetery, and again, as I mentioned earlier, they didn't really have a cemetery or have a huge cemetery segment up until more recently in the, in the most recent years. So you can see that um, percentage has kind of came a lot from um, the the acquired piece, where you can see the pre need revenue is slightly up above the same store revenue, and as they keep buying more companies, you'll see the at revenue or the at need revenue and the pre need revenue from the acquired piece come in and fall into the actual sales of the company as a whole. So looking at last year though, into 2021, and it's comparing 2021 to 2020, this is really the big thing that I wanted to mention when looking at the funeral home segment, you can see that the revenue was massive, you know, year over year, relatively speaking. Their growth rate isn't some like 30, 40% you know, growth rate. So not really that surprising to see them grow. It's maybe single digit, mid single digits, but it is something that I do want to mention because you can see that the acquired operating revenue didn't jump nearly as much as the same store operating revenue. And it's important to mention because again, you know, 2021 and 2020, we had a lot of COVID um, mishap and things and people pass away from it. So you can see down here the different metrics that they had again, contract volume as well as the average revenue per contract. You can see the big jumps there. And a lot of times what happened was they continue to acquire businesses, but obviously it's not going to outperform as much as the same stores were. Going down to the cemetery segment. So the same store operating revenues also jump for a cemetery. Again, not that surprising. And I'm not going to, you know, harp on that too much, but you can see just it's about a 20 million jump. Um, from 2020 into 2021. And we'll kind of touch on later what the revenue looks like further years back. But 
Going back down to the year-over-year -year, um, metrics for Cemetery, you can see again the pre-need as a percentage of operating revenue is about 61%, and then pre-need from the operating revenue on the acquired side was about 66 and 67%. So nothing too crazy there. It is important to recognize though how important that is and um, what they have done to actually you know get those acquisitions up and running and trying to get that actual profit down to the bottom line. Now, moving on over to the financials, you can take a look at the revenue from the last couple of years. So this is gonna be the trailing 12 months number. So, you know, if, you, if it looks kind of weird, that's why. So one thing I want to mention though, the most recent tra trailing 12 months was about $372 million. And you can see that giant growth pretty much from 2020 into 2022. And a lot of what they did is they took that cash, bought businesses and continued to buy back shares. So you know, not that surprising to see them use that money and actually expand the business even more. But you can see even in the prior years, and if you expand this out even further, they've been slowly but surely climbing, 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 generating free cash flow, acquiring businesses as needed, and actually generating some returns for their investors, which is always nice to see. Profit margin has been floating anywhere from 8 to 12%. It's kind of been jumping. And the hard part about this is as they acquire businesses, they're going to have a lot of depreciation and other things that they need to write down. So it's it's one thing to see sort of their earnings net income wise and their free cash flow. And if you can marry the two and make sure you recognize like kind of which direction both are going, that's the important thing to me. And free cash flow tells a better story um, for me than the actual net income of a company like this, where they're acquiring a lot of companies that have a lot of land, as well as goodwill and things like that on the balance sheet. Taking a look though, again, at the profit margin for the last couple of years, you can see it sort of bouncing up and down. Obviously, as we had the tick up in 2020 into 2022, you can see it sort of ramp up as the years have gone on, as well as the gross margin, as well as the operating margin. So that's something I wanted to mention as well. The current PE is at about an 8.8, .8, almost nine. Um, and the thing is, is that this doesn't trade like very expensive. And you can see here on the chart that when it traded like that, it went down in a heartbeat from 2020. And th this company's dropped a lot price wise. Um, you can see that on the top part of that chart, it's dropped a lot uh, down to 24, $23. I think it's the 52 week low of this year. But um, the PE has generally been between like 10 and 15. So if you're looking at it just on a PE basis, it may be slightly under what it's normal, what it normally is, but they expect growth next year. So it's possible that, you know, the forward PE is probably more accurate than the current PE listed here on this chart. Now, the other thing I want to mention, enterprise value to EBITDA, it's about 8, 8.9. Um, their current cash, their total debt, so their current cash, $821,000. I thought I was going crazy when I read that the first time. Nope, that is $821,000. It's not a million dollars. That's not... You know, I, I didn't mess up the math on that. That is definitely $821,000. Their total debt's about $567 million, which is obviously far above their current market cap. And you'll kind of see, and we'll talk about the debt here in a little bit, but I want to show you a chart really quick about what that total debt is actually looking like on a number basis. So you can see here that over the last sort of quarters, give or take, um, it's really ramped up the total debt and a lot of that has to do with the fact that they've made some pretty big acquisitions or they're in the middle of making big acquisitions right now and so you know they're going to have to take out debt to be able to buy these businesses and then pay down this debt with the free cash flow that comes in as well as he took out and he being Mel um, the CEO took out debt to be able to actually repurchase shares so we're going to kind of touch on that in a little bit. It's one of the risks that I had listed when I go down to my weaknesses, but just know that their their debt has been going up and that's something that you should consider, um, you know, if the risk to reward what the debt actually means in that equation. Because to me, I was really weary and I, you know, I'm still watching it, but they've announced some things that I want to touch on. So we'll keep going and come back to that. So the other thing I want to touch on is the actual industry that they operate in. And, you know, uh, some of these screenshots are going to come from their own investor day presentation, their own investor presentation, because Mel sees, you know, I think from the way that he presents everything, he presents it as if like, okay, if someone's investing in this company, what do they need to see? What do I need to give them to convince them to be an investor in this company? And that's really what he does. And I, I like the information that he gives. And that's why. Um, I, I wanted to include some of the slides. So the industry piece is, is the baby boomers as well as Gen X are going to be aging. They're kind of the lar one of the largest generations, generations. Um, 
they're one of the largest. And as we see these people kind of age off and pass away, unfortunately, we're going to see a lot of that wealth transfer as well as people who were able to actually afford funerals and able to actually afford cemeteries are probably going to pass as well. So the demographics that are shifting to an older demographic are going to be passing away. The average life expectancy is anywhere from 75 to 77 um, in the United States. And, you know, CSB is only in the United States. So that's why I wanted to mention it. But you can see here on the chart um, what that actually will look like. So here's the projected kind of aging population. And you can see over the years how big that sort of 75 to 85 plus is getting and the proportion of that population that's going to be 75 and 85 plus. So it's important to understand kind of like which direction it's going to go. And then the de the generations, I kind of wanted to add this in because some people don't know like currently what this is. So the generations, the way they're, they're listed. So Gen Z is anyone from 1997 to 2012, millennials from 1981 to 1996, Generation X is from 1965 to 1980. The boomers are 1946 to 64. And then the silent generations, 1928 to 45. Obviously, the silent generation is kind of at that age where people are passing away. But it's really, again, the baby boomers and the Gen X people that are going to, A, they have all the wealth. Not all of it. They have a broad majority of the wealth in the United States. As well as, B, they're also like the aging population that is one of the largest populations in the United States. So it is something that you want to you know, pay attention to because companies like a funeral home company are going to benefit, unfortunately, from people passing away. So it, it is something that I wanted to mention. And then the last thing is sort of the forecast and the death forecast and what people see in terms of like companies in the funeral home industry and how they'll do. So you can see over here, this is um, this chart came from uh, Maya. Hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. But they expect gross profit to hit $18.512 billion in 2025. And the thing is, is that when it comes to looking at this and what they're expecting, you can see that each year the gross profit as well as the turnover has slowly but surely ticked up and ticked up and ticked up. And obviously COVID brought a lot of that on. But you can see that even going forward, their projections is that 2022 to 2025, it's still going to tick up and keep ticking up another $7 billion. So it's really important that you understand like what this all actually looks like and what this actually means for everyone as a whole globally, as well as just in general um, in the United States. Because again, we have a you know age range of about 75 to 77 is the expected uh, age that people will live to and that's not going up like it's it's the last time I checked which was making this video It's not going up So it is something that I really do want to mention and something that I want to bring up because I think it's important to understand like industry as a whole What this actually looks like and then obviously the last thing that I want to mention is that it's a highly fragmented industry And that's going to lead me into my strengths and that's one of the things that I wanted to mention was that um, When it gets to the strengths the first strength that I want to talk about is the market share and what they actually are doing to acquire more market share and continue to grow into that market share. So when it comes to market share, I'm going to show a graph here. You can see that, you know, industry as a whole, uh, it's about a $20 billion revenue industry and CSV makes up about, you know, three, 3.5, you know, uh, probably not even a huge amount of the percent anymore. Um, this is a more recent screenshot, but anywhere from two to three percent of the industry as a whole, because it's only three hundred eighty-five million dollars in revenue. Now, obviously, it's down just a tiny bit this year, but um, they're going to continue to, con you know, try to grow. But you can see where it says other large consolidators revenue. The large person on this chart, so you can see three three point five billion dollars in revenue. Uh, it's not completely 3.5, but a large majority of that 3.5 and other large consolidated revenue is actually SCI, which is Services Corporation International. It's the largest funeral home, I guess, player market shareholder in the industry. And all this other sort of like 80% independent revenue, that's exactly what it sounds like. It's independent revenue. There's no like public company holding these funeral homes. And that's kind of where I see a lot of this opportunity, both for SCI and for CSV, to be able to actually buy funeral homes at a good price and buy them and keep them and expand their market as they keep adding on. And again, CSV has some, you know, 
companies or funeral homes that they're going to be adding to their portfolio of funeral homes here in a little bit in the next coming months. And they've already added a couple, like last month, they've already added one. So it's not really that surprising to see, you know, how fragmented this industry is, but it'll probably consolidate as companies keep growing, as leverage is used, as people are able to generate more free cash flow, and as aging populations continue to age. <laughs> Um, but the thing is that when it comes to um, market share and moat and things like that, the the benefit of having a funeral home is A, it's a really boring business. No one's really paying attention to it. B, it's not like a high growth industry that everyone's trying to break into. Like you see with some of the tech stocks and C, with the moat, once you buy the funeral home, you buy the cemetery, you own that land. And, you know, if you lease it, sure, you don't own it necessarily. But if you actually have bought and owned the land, no one else can come in and build on that land. And it's not like, in, especially in big counties like Los Angeles or San Francisco or, you know, city of Portland or New York City or anything like that. It's not like people can just build funeral homes left and right and actually just acquire a bunch of land to build funeral homes on. You got permits, you got things you got to do, you got a bunch of legal regulations that you have to follow and a bunch of other steps that have to be taken. So it's not like a break-in industry where people are trying to break uh, into this company and trying to, you know, put other companies out of business and really just try to outshine with their technology. That's not the case when it comes to a company like uh, CSV or SCI. And the thing is that when it comes to the moat, you own the land, it's really hard to add more funeral homes, especially in densely populated areas where there will be more people who will pass away. Um, it's very hard to add more funeral homes and add cemeteries because it's hard to buy the land or it's expensive to buy the land. So a lot of what this company does, they buy other funeral homes, renovate, build out, whatever they need to do with it if needed. And then they continue to just bring in free cash flow through selling their services and letting the management of the company run the actual funeral home itself. So when they acquire new new businesses, they just let whoever that's managing it and their part of their I guess research and due diligence is the manager of that funeral home. So if they see that they're a good manager, if they see that they have good EBITDA numbers, if they see that they have good sales numbers, they're gonna buy the funeral home. If they don't see a good manager but they see good sales, they're not gonna buy. So it's kind of like as if they're acquiring their own stock or own company um, to hold, they look at managers the same way that Warren Buffett might or the way that other, you know, like Brook Asset Management or other kind of asset held in companies will look at other stocks and, you know, bonds and things like that. So that's really interesting to see. It's, it's kind of uncommon in the public company space to see people do that. So the other strength that I wanted to mention was actually the funeral home contracts by quarter. So you can see here on the chart down below, 2020 and 2021 were very, very, very abnormal. And obviously when it comes to 2021 and 2022, you're going to see some changes here as it goes on. But the thing is, is that as we keep moving on into the next and coming quarters, coming years, um, it'll be interesting to see if this normalizes and continues to normalize higher than where 2018, 2019 were, or if it trends back down back to where those numbers are. But you can see for 2022, there is still, um, you know, above the normalized trend, even in the quarters like 20, or really Q2 and Q3 of this year, there wasn't as much of a COVID scare in the United States as there were in the previous years. So it'll be interesting to see Q4 numbers, what actually all that looks like, and if it still normalizes above it, as well as the coming quarters. But it is something I wanted to mention because the same store uh, contracts by quarter has been growing, continues to grow. And then obviously as they acquire more companies, that'll, that number of contracts overall will continue to grow as well. Now, the other strength and the final strength that I wanna mention, and I don't think, I don't normally mention like the leadership as part of the strengths or anything like that, but I do think it's important to mention is that Mel, the CEO, owns about eight to nine percent of the business in in general, and he's been running this business from almost the very beginning. I think he started the public company and everything, so he's been running this for quite some time. And obviously, he has an invested interest because a lot of his wealth is tied up in this company. So that gives him sort of the interest of the shareholder. So you and I might have the same interest as he does in terms of seeing this company grow and continue to wealthily. Uh, you know, fulfill whatever needs it has and continue to fill, fulfill the, the needs of the shareholders themselves. But from Mel's point of view, I love seeing how he operates the business. I love all the information he's giving. I love how transparent he's been about the mistakes and the wins and the losses that he has had. 
They're not afraid to say, hey, I messed up. One of the examples is that he took out debt to buy back shares and he immediately, you know, the last quarter he acknowledged, hey, I made the mistake of buying with debt when I shouldn't have. And obviously I'm going to touch on that in a little bit once we get on the debt piece, but it is important to see leaders actually step up, own their mistakes and keep moving rather than trying to go back and try to sugarcoat things or try to hide things and push it under the rug. As well as Mel has been, you know, a lot of experience in this space and he's continued to acquire businesses with that experience. And the thing is that the first couple of businesses that he had acquired in the early, you know, 2000s aren't going to be as good as the ones he's going to acquire now because he's taking a lot of the experience they learned here, whether he did it well or did it badly. And he's going to be moving and moving this experience here to be able to acquire businesses with a good amount of knowledge. So I'm really excited to see what he continues to do. I'm excited for his leadership and I enjoy his shareholder letters and it gives a lot of insight into the company. And I advise if you're going to, you know, look into this company at all, and obviously it's, I don't care if you buy or don't buy, but if you look in this company at all, whether or not you want to own this company, I think you should look at the shareholder letters. It's a wealth of knowledge, a business knowledge, you know, life experience, just everything in between. And I honestly, I loved reading the shareholder letters and I, I couldn't get enough of them. There's a lot of them uh, when you go through the different years, but it basically goes back to the 2000s into the 90s. So it's really interesting to see like what he actually has, but that's pretty much it for the strengths right now. We're going to hop on over to the weaknesses. So when it comes to the weaknesses, one of the things that I wanted to mention, as I had mentioned earlier, is the total debt. Now I explained that the total debt is primarily made up of debt that they use to buy businesses, as well as some of the debt that they use to buy back stock. But the thing is, is that their total debt to EBITDA ratio is at about 5.14. And this is one thing that they had mentioned in their own conference calls in the last year or so about their importance of leverage versus their actual business and making sure that they be, stay a financial fortress and that they continue to grow organically rather than levering up too much. So the thing is that, again, they acknowledge that 5.14 is way too high for what they want. And so they're shooting for about 4 to 4.3 over the next two years as to how they're going to get that down. So they're not going to grow their sh dividend anymore. They're not going to repurchase any shares until they see that leverage start to come down a lot more. And they're going to focus on that. And that was actually a very recent, recent letter that they put out and kind of just a general statement from Mel as a whole about the importance of getting to 2024, deleveraging, and actually making sure that they don't have to worry about the financials of the company. Now, if you want to see more about that, go click the link down below into the article that I wrote, and then you can see I have a link to like the actual letter that they had put out, or you can go on their website and just look at the most recent, I think it was an 8K or press release that they put out. Either way, fairly interesting. I think it's pretty important for people to read. But moving on, the other weakness that I wanted to mention was a cremation rate. Now I'm going to pop up a chart here that shows like what their five quarter operating financial trend is. And you can see um, here the same store average revenue per contract is about $5,396. Their average same store cremation average revenue was about $3,500. So you can see there's a huge difference there. And that's the really the big weakness and risk that I want to touch on too, is the fact that the cremations are, they're cost less for the customer. And so a lot of people are going for a cremation versus a traditional funeral and actually using the cemetery. They're just going for the cremation and it's going to continue to grow. They're forecasting to be that anywhere from 80% to 85% of you know just general memorials and things like that or when people pass away they're going to use cremation now this projection isn't going to hit until 2035 so there is still some time just for that to change but the forecast of about 80 to 85 percent is pretty huge when you think about it and what it actually could do to the industry as a whole and whether or not um, companies like this are actually going to benefit or if they're going to lose sales because of people actually changing over to cremation versus a traditional funeral now, the last risk and the obvious risk, or I feel it's obvious, but um, the last risk that I want to touch on is the importance of their acquisition model. Their strategic acquisition model is what they use to buy companies. And so a lot of it relies on growth and EBITDA, growth and sales and good management. Obviously, there's probably some other key factors in there, but those are some of the ones that I want to mention that are kind of easy to remember and easy to look at. So the thing is, though, with the risk is that um, when it comes to a company that relies on acquiring new businesses, you're hoping that the management of your current company, so the management of CSP, 
does a good job of due diligence, does a good job of picking managers to run their funeral homes. Because again, it's a decentralized model, similar to Berkshire, similar to other acquisitions that people have made throughout the years. Basically, they buy the funeral home, they give them the knowledge, give them the, the kind of management leeway to be able to run them how they see fit based on the market that they're in. Obviously, management will step in where needed, but it's not like a, you know, hand holding or anything like that. So the possibility of a bad acquisition kind of goes up with each acquisition that they make. And especially as they get into larger and larger and larger acquisitions, the needle starts to be able to move if it's a bad acquisition, it starts to move a lot more than in, at the beginning where it was a little bit smaller, it wasn't a huge business. If they make a mistake, oh well. If they didn't make a mistake, it's going to grow and continue to grow. But if it's a bad acquisition or a bad manager, that could be a risk and thing that I want to mention here. So it is something, but um, the risks overall are kind of risks for general businesses, but I think specific to them, the, the leverage as well as the acquisition model is pretty big risk. And it's something that I think I should consider as well as others should consider if you're going to look at this business and continue to research it. Now, the last piece and probably the most important piece for a lot of people is the actual intrinsic value that I've calculated for myself and what I believe I think the company may be worth. I use this as more of like a yardstick to figure out like, am I in the same ballpark rather than I will not pay above or below a certain amount based on my intrinsic value. So don't worry about this being like a hard set number. Your number may be different than mine if you run your own numbers, but it's something I want to touch on because I think it's important to understand like where in the ballpark are we right now? So looking at it though, so you can see again the top piece. So you have the current revenue, the current outstanding shares, the price at the time of looking at this. So it's, you know, $26. I think the company's down a little bit um, as of today, but $26. So currently their current free cash flow, current net income, it's about 40 million and 30 million. The current revenue is 360 million. Um, and then, so moving on down, you can see the revenue growth. I got 1%, 3%, 5%. I think that is being more than conservative on the low end, probably even more conservative than on the high end, especially going into the back half. So this is a seven year, um, you know, look forward and try to estimate the intrinsic value. Profit margin, five to seven or 5% to 9%. Free cash flow 7% to 10%, terminal PE 15, and free per terminal free cash flow P is 15 to 20. So um, the discount rate I use is 12.5%, as well as you can see here. So my fair value that I get right now is about $28. And I sold puts at $20 with a strike at $20, but I get a fair, fair value at $28. So um, the reason that I sold puts on this and the reason that I bought uh, or I guess sold the put at such a low strike was because, again, it's a bigger part of my portfolio. So if I'm going to end up buying 100 shares of this company, I want to make sure it's at a lower strike relative to the sizing of it because it'd be $2,000 out of a $20,000 portfolio. So it would be about 10% of my, you know, assets as a whole for my portfolio. So I wanted to make sure that I didn't like go crazy by buying a bunch of shares, but I also wanted to sell a put. So that way this put expires in July 1st, 2023. It's $1.85 was what I sold it for. I think it was like $1.84. It's what it ended up being after um, the fees. So it's about $180 altogether from the premium. I hold the put base or sold the put for about, you know, six, seven months. Um, and then from there, I just have to sit tight and wait. If the company drops below $20, I get the shares at $20. If the company stays above $20 and the put is never exercised, I get the $180 I got earlier and then I continue to walk and I could sell another put on this or I could buy shares or whatever I wanted to do on this company. But the important thing to me is that um, I like selling puts. I got a pretty good premium relative to the strike price. Um, so I like this. It was just, I think it was just below 10% of the strike dollar 80. Yeah. I think it was like just below 10% of the strike. Um, but I really like this company. I like what it has. I like everything about the management. Obviously the leverage and everything is a risk to me, but I sold puts. I like, um, where they're standing at currently. Um, I, I really do think that this company is undervalued currently. And that's why I decided to buy in or decided to sell puts on it and hopefully get to buy in. Um, I'm ready if this goes down below 20 and I get put the shares at 20. I'm totally okay with holding it at that. So um, I'm looking forward to keeping you all updated on this to let you know, you know, whatever happens with this. But in conclusion, we're going to wrap things up for today. I like the company. I like what I sold it at. 
I think I've got a good margin of safety at $20. It's really less than $20 since my net outflow is going to be lower because I got premium. But with that being said, thank you all so much for joining me today. I hope you found it interesting. Make sure to subscribe, stay tuned, and have a great day and have happy investing.